This is episode nine of the History of Podcast. I'm Robert. And I'm Emma. And today we will be talking about the history of the internet. Now, quick note, we do have a YouTube channel, same name as our podcast. Please go check it out. Super fun stuff. Yep. Uh, but yeah, please, please check out our YouTube channel. Um, we have something to say before we, we start the episode. And that is the Ed Carton count. Oh, yes. And today's Ed Carton count is 13. I Woo-hoo! believe 13 at last last count. So, yes, we're we're moving up. It's better than the last time. They say it's an unlucky number, but I think I think this is an exception for sure. Oh, yes. So 13. It's only getting. Can you can you just hear it? Can you hear that 13th Ed Carton? I bet you can. OK, there are so many things to cover in this episode. Yeah. That if we went into full depth on each piece of history about the internet, we would go on for hours and it would get very boring because the internet is a very big place. (laughs) Indeed, yes. Hopefully we are helping you just get a general idea of a timeline and major companies and inventions that were involved with the internet. We could probably do individual episodes on each thing we discussed today if we wanted to, We're just skimming the surface. Yeah, and since this episode has so much to cover, I thought I would just name a couple things at the beginning that we won't be diving that deep into so that you don't say, oh, you forgot it. No, we didn't forget it. We just didn't believe that these things were essential to the internet episode because this is is already a very long episode. It is. So these things are hacking, spam email, major algorithms, including Bayesian filters, emojis, viral videos, online games, webcams, GIFs, the dark web, advertising banners, Netscape, Lycos, Open Durs, tell me if I pronounced that wrong, ICQ, Adobe Flash, blogging, Napster, iMode, LimeWire, viruses, CAPTCHA or CAPTCHA, uh, Wikipedia, video calls, MySpace, 4chan, Facebook, Twitter, downloading and uploading, and Ethernet. Okay. You've been warned. You also, have, you have been warned. there are a lot of acronyms and shortened words in this episode. Let's start off by giving a little background on how the internet works. So many of us don't question it, we just accept it. So let's dive in. Yeah, there's there's this thing called internet protocol or IP. Sound familiar? IP address. You have an IP address. Uh, if Surely you do if, you have, if you're able to listen to this. Uh, and the internet protocol is the instruction manual for how computers interact with each other. Um, If you want to get into the nitty gritty on that, please just go into software development or web development because that's where you should be if you're actually interested in that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, all the information on the internet has a host location. That information goes from the host location or IP address to your IP address by hopping over a series of routers until it gets to your router. Believe it or not, I'm pretty sure your internet router processes processes a lot of other people's information. Experts, please tell me if I'm getting this wrong. I guess that also means a lot of other internet routers. Routers? Routers? I think it's a router. Router? That doesn't sound right. I don't know. A lot of other people's process your information. Dun dun. <laughs> In an example like the cloud. Okay, well, I, I hate to break to you. But the cloud is not an actual cloud, not in an actual cloud. What? Have Uh, I been lied to this whole time? Yes. The cloud is actually a bunch of massive servers in some rural place like Utah where your stuff is stored. Dang, Utah. Then, so that would be the host location. And then your computer can talk to their, so you put your, you store your stuff in their servers and then that becomes a host location. And then your computer can talk to theirs with computer talk, uh, you know, the computers, whoever you have the cloud with, examples, IBM, Amazon, mm-hmm. um, and then you can access your data and, you know, it can be sent back to you. Amazing. All this internet stuff started out small, as we will discuss in a minute, and we've just kept adding on to it. And it still works. Still works. Uh, now we've, we've gotten our head spinning on an oversimplified explanation of how the internet works. So now let's get into the internet internet's history, a uh, different kind of internet history. <laughs> um, and I think something we needed to discuss for a moment is that the world went on without an internet. You know, it wasn't before, 
I don't know, say in 1940s, it wasn't the total dark ages. So people were still getting along. Like it's the internet is important, but it's not, I guess society has become dependent on it, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's not, it doesn't, the whole world doesn't rely upon the internet 100% per se. Um, so something to mention, no matter what the memes or the CNN interviews tell you, Al Gore did not invent the internet. Although he is in the Internet Hall of Fame, uh, I've got it linked in the description. He's like, there's an Internet Hall of Fame and Al Gore is in it. Hmm. This is crazy. I will say he had the government give it a push of development with the High Performance Computing Act of 1991. So that's something. Yeah, it was really just like a lot of funding uh, for for research. I've also got that uh, linked in the show notes if you want to check out the, the details on that. Amazingly, one of today's main sources um for this episode is actually the first registered domain name it's called symbolics.com and it is the online museum of the internet bet you didn't know that existed uh i was expecting only to include it as a source because it was the first registered domain name i wasn't expecting it to actually provide a significant amount of useful information for the research pretty amazing regardless visions or ideas for the internet go back as early as, ready, 1934 with a Belgian lawyer and librarian named Paul Otlet. He had the idea or prediction that someday the current, current being 1934, infrastructure of things like radio, television, and telephone would become a mechanical collective brain. As you can imagine, Otlet's ideas were not well received in his time, but today he is seen as the father of information science. He was actually believed in his time to be a little bit insane, but he's gone from that to the father of information science. It's incredible. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, a government agency that used to be called ARPA, which stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency. It got started in 1958 and came out of the space program. Today it's called DARPA. Uh, The D at the beginning stands for defense because the agency started focusing on projects more gauged towards warfare. Um, But just going off on a tangent, this agency is out of control. Like all the technology they develop looks like something out of a futuristic movie. And if you're a nerd who's into robotics or maybe was into that like IP stuff before um, or advanced programming or aviation, Uh, that looks like it's out of a sci-fi movie, then please look into DARPA. Um, But the reason we mentioned ARPA, the old version of DARPA, is um, in the first place is that this agency did some real pioneering when it comes to the internet. In 1962, they had this one thing called the, ready, online system or NLS. I guess that's where the phrase online comes from. This online system was a computer with a lot of firsts like a mouse, information organized by relevance, hyperlinks, and screen windowing. This was a big deal. Uh, This episode is not about the history of the computer, um, but these these features would definitely be mentioned in, these things would be mentioned in uh, a history of the computer episode. But this is the internet, not the computer. Uh, But these these features um, that this computer um, introduced are really just staples and what makes uh, the internet user-friendly today. Later, in 1969, ARPA created the first computer network called ARPANET. It was small, as it only connected a few massive and hilariously expensive, but separated computers. Big things start... Big things start small, kids. ARPANET is considered the grandfather of the internet. In 1975, uh, there was a little startup called Microsoft, and here was the company's original purpose. Uh, So there was this computer named the Altair by a company called MITS, M-I-T-S. There was also, and still is, a programming language called BASIC. I'm actually uh, trying to get into programming now, learning a a program called Just BASIC, which is like the the introductory introductory version. Um, But at this time, BASIC was not compatible with the Altair computer, 
So Microsoft created some software that allowed programmers to code with BASIC on the Altair computer. This was a huge success, and Microsoft branched out to other things, making its own Microsoft BASIC programming language. Later, in 1980, Microsoft developed the operating system for IBM's line of computers. By the way, whenever you see OS, like Mac OS, that stands for operating system. Yeah, I've learned so many so many uh, acronyms and like shortened words with this episode. It's crazy. Uh, but soon after this, after the uh, after Microsoft developed IBM's line of um, operating systems, they created the Microsoft Disk Operating System, or MSDOS. Then, in 1995, there came the Windows 95 Operating System, as well as the launch of Internet Explorer, which was Microsoft's default browser up until Windows 10. At that point, Microsoft Edge took over. This is not to mention Microsoft Office with PowerPoint, Word, Excel, OneNote, and Access, which leads some to think that the company was a bit of a monopoly, but that's a whole different story. Um, and in case you didn't know, the uh, the name Microsoft is a portmanteau. We talked about portmanteaus in the Cutlery Part 2 episode, which is essentially a combination of two words, two words put together. For example, smog is um, smoke and fog. Mm -hmm. um, and so... My, the name Microsoft is a portmanteau of the two words micro, microprocessor and software, Microsoft. Makes sense. Since we just briefly discussed the rise of Microsoft, let's talk about some other key players when it comes to the internet. The number one name to remember is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He proposed the idea for the World Wide Web, or WWW, in 1989. He laid out his plan for the concept in a paper called Information Management. A proposal. Quite exciting, I would believe. <laughs> he didn't get enthusiastic help at first, but eventually this idea became a project unofficially through CERN, C-E-R-N, a notable part particle physics lab in Switzerland. Out of this, we can thank Sir Tim Berners-Lee for HTMLs, which stand for Hypertext Markup Language, HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and URIs, which stands for Uniform Resource Identifier, commonly referred to as URLs. Guys, this guy did a lot. This guy did a lot. Like, he... This guy made the internet the way we know it today. Okay, ARPA, don't get mad at me. But this is this is the point in the show where I uh, I tie in... Like, like, we have links, you know, as you can see uh, in our... Uh, in our show notes. So those are using, what, HTMLs, right? So that was a total meta moment. Got to test out that new jingle. Please, guys, don't don't try to cringe too hard on that one. If you have any questions or comments about that jingle, please email us and I will, I will read it. I'm trying to get a little kid to do it, so I'm going to see... We can test that out next show. I want to see how that sounds with a little kid. Like, okay. That would sound a lot better. Okay. If you're a Zoomer around my age, chances are you haven't heard a lot about AOL or aren't quite sure uh, what they're talking about when the Gen Xers and Boomers refer to it. AOL stands for America Online, and it got started as an online computer game in 1983. However, it wasn't called AOL until 1991. Only a couple years after its beginning, the company t was looking to stretch its wings and expand, like most capitalist ventures. Uh, they teamed up with Radio Shack, which was called Tandy Corporation Tandy. at the time. Yeah, I know. And introduced something called PC Link in 1988. Then in 1989, AOL, uh, which was known as Quantum then, uh, allowed users on both PC and Apple devices a little different than the, the PC versus Apple war today, or the Android versus Apple war today. But they allowed um, users of both PC Link and Apple Link to email each other. And this was a big deal to have email that went across, mm -hmm. across domains. Now, for the most part, the company focused on email, news, and reference services. In the following years, AOL continued to grow, but it had one foundational quality, which was bound to cause its downfall. This was the fact that America Online was restrictive and somewhat separated from the rest of the internet. It was also designed to be the training wheels service that introduced rookies to the internet. And the only thing is today, 
we don't really see ourselves as rookies to the internet, even though a vast majority of us, I'm included, use the internet wildly ignorantly. I will say America Online still has users, it's just not like it was in the late 90s and early 2000s. Okay, that's AOL. And in 1995, following the timeline, there was an initially popular uh, search engine called AltaVista. We know how many people use that now. Actually, AltaVista got bought by Overture, which got bought by Yahoo. So that's under Yahoo, and we'll talk about that in a moment. In 1997, a technology came out called Wireless Application Control, also known as WAP, W-A-P. This was a popular early technology that allowed internet access for mobile phones. You know, for example, Nokia phones. This was some of the first bringing together of the phone and the internet. Also in 1997, Wi-Fi was invented. Boop, boop. Uh, we won't talk, be talking much about that, but that's short for wireless fidelity. I have, and you probably have too, heard of the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s, but I never really knew what that meant. The dot-com bubble started in the late 1990s with a bull market. So now a bull market is a prolonged phase of market rise. So it was a bull market of technology-oriented companies, especially the NASDAQ, which is an index of mostly tech stocks. Now, as you can imagine, this bull market attracted a lot of investors. However, many of the promising tech startup companies turned, ab turned out to be fads and didn't last very long. So as the bubble of exciting uh, tech wealth grew bigger and bigger, the fads were exposed and the bubble popped in the spring of 2000, actually in March, entering a bear market, which is a prolonged phase of market low. Um, and if you want to find out exactly... Uh, why that happened, please check out the links. Um, I included some links in the show notes, um, but we won't be going over much of the specifics in this episode. I'm trying to keep it short. However, a dot-com business that didn't bust was Yahoo. It started out in 1994 with two Stanford graduate students who made lists of their favorite links to things on the web. Yeah, that's a kind of a nerdy thing to I, do. I love that. Nice. Their lists got bigger and bigger, and they broke it up into categories and subcategories. And at first, their website uh, for this was called, well, they made a website for this, and it was called uh, Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web. That sounds like a really cool book. Of course, <laughs> that was changed to Yahoo with an exclamation point. The company became incorporated in 1995, and like every other corporation we've talked about on this episode, they continued to broaden their horizons with Yahoo Mail, Yahoo News, Yahoo Answers, and others. This is not to mention all the smaller companies Yahoo bought out like MyQuest, SearchFox, and Right Media. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. 1998, Google was founded by Sergey Brin and Larry Page. Please don't say Google was invented. Google is not an invention. It is a company, and it was founded. <laughs> Bryn and Paige were going to call it Backrub at first, but Google worked out better. Yeah, Google I, worked out better. Yeah. Uh, after some debate, the entrepreneurs determined their vision was to develop a search engine that, prior that prioritized search results by the number of links in the domain instead of uh, word match. So, like, the, the keywords and how many keywords match. Is this why Wikipedia always comes up first? Because they Maybe. always have like 150 links. They do have a lot of links. I feel like I still see some other methods of prioritization though. Like in YouTube, clearly YouTube videos can be prioritized by links. Or like there's certain algorithms that we won't be get, that that was actually in the list of things that we're not covering is different algorithms of uh, prioritization. And one other thing Google started out with a motto of, don't be evil. Like, why why would you even need to include that? Why would you have evil in your motto? I don't know. That's a problem. Regardless, with the help of some investors, the company snowballed in popularity and success until about 2000. And then it was like a match in a pool of gasoline. Eventually, Google was handling so much data that they established 11 different locations uh, for servers, data servers around the world. 
Google bought YouTube pretty early on in the game in 2006. And in 2015, Google went uh, under or became a subsidiary, uh, subsidiary of its now parent company, Alphabet. As you know, we got the transitive verb Google from the company Google. I love how you mention transitive. Yes, yes. It is defined by Merriam-Webster as to use the Google search engine to obtain something about, and the, there's a parenthesis, not, yes, parentheses, uh, someone or something, unparentheses, on the World Wide Web. I didn't know, I, I've always thought this was a fake verb. I didn't know this was an actual mm -hmm. verb. Okay. Even though above 70% of all online searches are on Google, they go beyond a search engine with Gmail, uh, Google Drive, Google Maps, Google Translate, and a myriad of other services. I'm an avid Google Maps user, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but something I learned with this episode is that the internet was not a, uh, a, not a pinpoint invention, uh, a spark, but an evolution, just like so many other curious foods, sports, holidays, and developments of history. Needless to say, the internet has become an integrated part of our daily lives. It is powerful and open-sourced, but as the old cliche goes, with great power comes great responsibility. The internet has come a long way, and whether good or bad, who knows where it will take us in the future. If you have any questions or comments about the information provided in this episode, please contact us at, here we go, the gmail, the email, the history of 365 at gmail.com. Meta moment. I had to use that one again. Contact us if that jingle annoys you or if you really like it. Have a blessed day. And you've got to promise me something. Never stop learning. <laughs>